Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, welcome to the Whitney. Um, and it's great to have you here and to be in person together. Um, my name is Megan Hoyer, and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Public Engagement here. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to The Laughing Snake, an evening with Morshan Alari and Oslam Goner. This program is organized in conjunction with the exhibition Refigured, currently on view in our first floor gallery and organized by my colleague Christian Paul. This extraordinary show presents six works from the Whitney's collection that reflect on interactions between digital and physical materiality. Several of the works, including The Laughing Snake, were initially commissioned by Christian for Artport, the Whitney's digital portal to internet art and an online gallery space um, an online gallery space for commissions of net art and new media art. The galleries downstairs will be open following the program and we invite you to visit or revisit the exhibition until 10 p.m. tonight. So we're thrilled to be hosting Morrison for tonight for a live reading of The Laughing Snake in which she retells a 14th century story from Kitab al-Buhan, The Book of Wonders. Using this medieval text to explore hysteria, street harassment, impositions of morality, and the experience of living in a female body in Iran in the 21st century. After the performance, Morishin will be joined in conversation about the work um, and the ongoing women-led revolution in Iran by Dr. Oslam Goner, a scholar and activist who researches state violence, social movements, gender and intersectionality, and anti-colonial self-determination. As we consider the question of self-determination and what transnational solidarity might look like, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that tonight we are gathered on the unceded lands of the Lenape people. As a result of centuries of colonialism, today the Lenape are dispersed throughout the US and Canada. Alongside the Lenape, many other indigenous nations have ancestral ties to this place now known as New York, including the six Haudenosaunee nations, the Seneca, Cayuga, Tuscarora, Mohawk, Oneida, and Onondaga, as well as the Shinnecock and Puspatuck. As a museum of American art in a city with vital and diverse communities of indigenous people, the Whitney is committed to honoring the perspectives of indigenous artists and communities as we work for a more equitable future together. Um, and now I am very pleased to turn it over to Christian Paul, who will say a bit more about Morrison's work and introduce her and Oslam. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Megan, and uh, thanks so much to everyone for coming tonight. I'm very excited about having uh, Morishim and uh, Oslam here, and we'll introduce them a little bit uh, now. So uh, Morishim Alayari is a New York-based uh, Kur Iranian Kurdish artist and uses 3D simulation, video sculpture, and digital fabrication as tools to refigure myth and history. And the title of uh, the exhibition downstairs, Refigured, is also very much inspired by Morishin's practice. All the works in the show are refiguring material forms and bodies to reflect on identity and selfhood. Uh, as Megan mentioned, the hypertext narrative, The Laughing Snake, was originally commissioned by the Whitney Museum in collaboration with Liverpool Biennial and Fact uh, Liverpool. And the story uses the myth of a jinn, a supernatural or monstrous uh, figure in Arabian mythology to its to explore the status of women and of the female body. So in the original uh, story, a snake has taken over a city, is torturing it, is uh, murdering its people and animals, and nobody manages to get rid of it until an old man appears with a mirror and the snake dies laughing at her own reflection. And what uh, Morishin does in her hypertext narrative is really use this 
story and myth and the mirroring to uh, refract images of otherness and monstrosity and also question the perception of females as monstrosity. The work is part of the uh, series, She Who Sees the Unknown, in which Morishin has literally refigured some of those jinns and uh, told their stories. All of these figures existed as uh, images in books, and what Morishin is doing is really recreating them as uh, sculptures. So after commissioning the hypertext here, the Whitney Museum also acquired the actual sculpture you see downstairs in a mirrored corner. So uh, Morishin really always weaves together complex counter-narratives in opposition to the lasting influence of Western technologies, digital uh, technologies, through archival practices and uh, through storytelling. Uh, she is the recipient of the 2016 Leading Global Thinkers Award by Foreign Policy magazine, and her work has been exhibited in uh, numerous exhibitions and museums, including the Venice Architecture, Architectural um, Biennial, the New Museum, the Centre Pompidou, uh, the Tate, and many others. And the work has also been featured in the New York Times, Huffington Post, Wired, Freeze, Hyperallergic, and many other publications. Uh, Oslem Gunars is an associate professor at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the College of State and Ireland and Middle Eastern Studies at the Graduate Center of CUNY, the City University of New York. And her book entitled Turkish National Identity and Its Outsiders, Memories of State Violence in Dursim was published by Rutledge in June 2017. She has uh, written numerous academic and popular journal articles, uh, and is a steering committee member of the Emergency Committee for Rojava. And please welcome Morshin Alayari, who will start with her performance now. Thank you so much. She who saw all things in a broad bond earth and beyond, and knew what was to be known. She who had seen what there was, and had embraced the otherness. She to whom the image clung like a mirror, a display of crisis, and who dwelt together with a devised becoming. She knows and sees the unknown, and lays them bare. She is the monstrous other, the dark goddess, the possessive jinn, the dividing persona. She restores myth and histories, the untold and the forgotten, the misread and uneven, those off and from the Near East. She is the laughing snake, known as the one mirrored. She is daughter to no warrior, wife to no nobleman, mother to no hero. She stands rootless, yet rooted. The one displaced the same elsewhere. She is the destroyer of all occupiers, the killer of the people of no sky, capturing those with wings who do not fly, putting out every fire in, pa in favor of her own flame. Her story is told at every edge of the world, a gen no one could elude. One time into the past and one time into the future, they prayed, you have created this monster, now give her her equal. But no equal was found to fight her. All eyes on her, they held a mirror in front of her. When she saw her reflection, she burst into laughter. She laughed for days and nights until she died. I'm six in Tehran. My grandmother catches me rubbing my vagina on the sofa arm, on the pillow, on soul of my soul, on the edge of a bench in a public park, on the steepest part of a rock at the Caspian Sea, on my doll's head on the plain. And she tells me if I keep doing this, a snake will come out of my vagina. I do it more and more and more. And every time I do it and there is no snake, 
I know this is yet another victory over a world I keep at distance. One day I discovered that in English, the word virginity can be used both for men and women. In Farsi, it's only used for women and the loss of hymen. Some women would get hymen repair and surgery before marriage, so that they would bleed when they have sex with their husband for the first time. I lost my virginity at the age of 15. No shame, no regret, no shame. Imagine being married for 14 years, never having an orgasm. That's the story of Anonymous X, very close to me, who was ashamed to know her body. She felt guilty for masturbating. I encouraged her to, and one day she left him for another man. Her husband called me a bad influence. I'm 12 at school and in our theology class, our teacher tells us that if we keep on not covering our hair completely under the scarf, on the last judgment day, God will hang us from every strand of our hair. And I have one of those disobedient heads with all my hair out. I raise my hand to say, I don't want to pray to a God that is that cruel. And I will get suspended from school for two days. And somehow for months and years since then, I keep imagining a scene where God is that cater caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland and it's the last judgment day. And I'm hung from every single strand of my hair. And God says, explain yourself. And I laugh hysterically to say, I'm afraid I can't explain myself because I'm not myself, sir. Every once in a while, we felt brave enough to let the wind blow through our hair, which could cause an arrest, maybe some hours of jail, maybe getting harassed or beaten by the moral police, but we still did it, and the universe made an example of us for being this faithful to its elements. At the airport, the airport security woman made my sister and I remove our nail polish in a room. She said, or we won't let you get on the plane. They gave us sugar cubes, and while it removed the nail polish from our fingers, it scratched up our nails. Did you know you could remove your nail polish with sugar cubes? I'm 16, I'm 17, I'm 18, I'm 19, I'm 20, I'm 21, I'm 22. And please know that I'm just existing, walking around in the streets of Tehran in pants with a long manteau covering all my body and a scarf, taking the public taxi, standing in some line, taking the bus, sitting down somewhere, and young, boy, young boys, middle-aged fathers, old, old grandpas, casually cat call me every single day to tell me what a nice piece of pussy I am, to tell me I want to fuck you and your mother, to tell me you look like a whore with that makeup, to tell me I can put my dick inside your ass if you want to stay a virgin. And young boys, middle-aged fathers, old, old grandpas casually touch my lap and my breast and my ass, rub their penis on me in some crowded place, follow me for blocks at night, forcing me to get their number. And young boys, middle-aged fathers, old, old grandpas, ask for directions and show their penis in the car before driving off laughing. Walk to me and whisper, if you waited right here at the bus station, I will come back to pick you up after dropping my daughter. He points out to his daughter sitting in the car and she's my age. And young boys, middle-aged fathers, old, old grandpas, casually, make it into my nightmares, my subconsciousness, somewhere deep in my soul. And young boys, middle-aged fathers, old, old grandpas, casually repeat into each other. All eyes on her, they held a mirror in front of her. When she saw her reflection within the world, she burst into laughter from the image, them holding a mirror. She laughed hysterically for days and nights until she died. And I'll be standing on a stage and there will be a ceremony and I'll be raising my head and I will see a lineup of hundreds, thousands, millions of girls. And they will each hold a safety pin up to the air and one girl will come forward to give me my own. 
and she will whisper into my ear, carry this with you everywhere you go. And this will become the weapon of my generation. And in Farsi, we call safety pin Sanja Qufli, which translates to locking, securing pin. And years later, when I learned the word in English and I won't stop thinking about the uncanny coincidence of words and objects, and our stories we were too ashamed to share. And years later, from this future, none of this will even be a thing. And won't this be our revolution? And won't this be our revolution? And won't this be our revolution? Laugh at the revolution, unless it's our revolution. And they will hold a mirror in front of me, in front of her, and I, she, will lock a safety pin to my, her collar, and I, she, won't even be wearing a scarf because I, she, has the choice not to, and I, she, will laugh while tears run down my, her face. And I, she will immediately recall my, her grandmother saying, to befriend or conquer a jinn, always have a safety pin fastened to your clothes. And the laughing mistake and I will become one, and we will be mirrored mirroring, and we will appear to recede into an infinite distance that is the future. And won't we celebrate this diffracted future? And won't we celebrate this diffracted future? And won't we celebrate this diffracted future? Laugh at the future unless it's our future. She who saw And I will walk out and I will be on the bus and he will sit next to me and he will slowly start rubbing his elbow to my left breast and he will look out the window like nothing is happening while doing it and I will take my safety pin out and I will calmly push it into his leg and I will push it in and I will push it in so much and so hard and so fiercely and the more I push it in the more blood will come out and the more I push it in the more his body falls apart and the more I push it in the more he will disappear and the whole world will be watching, and he will be gone, and I will return to my body. And won't she turn around her image? And won't she turn around her image? And won't she turn around her image? Laugh at the image, unless it's our image. Thank you. Thank you for being here. It's always surreal when I, you know, going back to this piece actually since, you know, everything has been happening. I wrote this piece in 2018 and um, in the last seven months, it's, you know, feel even more relevant to the conversation that has been happening, you know, on a daily basis. Um, I wanted to start with thanking Whitney Museum, especially Christian Paul for your continuous support of my work, to Megan and Andy for making this event possible. Uh, we're now going to the second part of tonight's event, which is the honor of having um, Ozlam Gonar on stage with us. As we will unpack in our conversation, Ozlam and I not only share a history of being courts, but also we also use our family and life stories as inspiration for doing the work we do. When we met two weeks ago to discuss some of the topics of tonight's event, I asked her um, if she remembered when she became a feminist. It's a question inspired by the feminist Killjoy text by Sara Ahmed, in which she says, quote, it can be hard to remember becoming a feminist if only because it is hard to remember a time that you did not feel that way. Is it possible to have always been that way? Is it possible to have been a feminist right from the beginning? A feminist story can be a beginning. Perhaps we can make sense of the complexity of feminism as an activist space if we can give an account of how feminism becomes an object of feeling, as something we invest in, as a way of relating to the world, a way of making sense of how we rela relate to the world. When did feminism become a word that spoke not just to you, but spoke you, that spoke of your existence or even spoke you into existence? How do we gather by gathering around this word? sticking to each other by sticking to it. I think I remember the time when I became a feminist or when I recognized the harms of patriarchy and a gender-biased, gender-apartheid society. 
I was young and obsessed with my Kurdish grandmother who lived with us and who always told me stories about her life, about when she got married at the age of 11, about how she never got a chance to learn to read or write, about how she was treated in a patriarchal household in which men ruled the rules. I remember her crying once and I asked her why she cried. She said that she cried for herself. As a young girl, these words and stories made an unforgettable impact on me. When she died, I was only 12, and I made a vow to tell her story to the world. So from age 12 to 15, I wrote a 384 pages novel of her life that got published in Iran when I was 16. I tell this story because I wonder what is your story of seeing, knowing, not ever being able to unsee patriarchy, of becoming a feminist. The ongoing woman life freedom or Jina revolution was sparked by the killing of 22-year-old Kurdish Jina Mahsa Amini in the hands of the regime's police on September 16, 2022. Ever since, Iran has experienced a nationwide uprising, primarily led by women and marginalized ethnic groups demanding an end to the current Islamic regime and the establishment of a society free of oppression, discrimination, and dictatorship. Tonight, we will dive into the deep roots of the Women Life Freedom slogan and the learnings we can learn from dec decades of Kurds' struggles for justice and liberation. With that, I would like to invite you, Muslim, to join me on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Morishin, for, I feel like after that brilliant performance, um, it's hard to talk, <laughs> but um, we'll, we'll, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you Whitney Museum, and thank you Megan, Megan who, you know, for inviting me over. Thank you. Thanks. Such, such an honor. Um, so I kind of, you know, um, we've been talking a little bit about some of some of the themes and parts that, you know, um, again, our research and work is, is shared. And I wanted to actually start with a very, like, simple question, uh, which is that if we can start by talking about the origin of the slogan, Jen Jian Azadi, Woman Life Freedom, I think at this point many of you, if you're not Iranian, have heard about that slogan. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a very good start, especially, you know, seeing harassment, feeling it, being silenced about it, being shamed about it, so much so that, you know, you're ashamed of yourself when someone rubs themselves on you without any shame on a bus, you know. Um, that. And these experiences and these bodily experiences, the shoulders that shrug our bodies that keep it all while we're trying to forget. Um, and, and that is why, I guess since I was a little child, every time there was a protest in my hometown, which I am you know, from, I'm from a Kurdish town um, in, Bakur, which is occupied Kurdistan uh, under the Turkish colonial rule. And every time I saw as a child that people are protesting some inequality, some injustice, something that happened, a Kurdish person that was killed again, a Kurdish revolutionary who was kidnapped, tortured by the Turkish state again, and people went out to protest despite intense police and military violence. And every time it happened, it gave a little girl there a little hope about an otherwise quite an oppressive world. And at the time, you know, um, this was 1980s and the Kurdish movement um, was growing um, in my hometown of Dersim, like the rest of Bakur, the rest of colonized, occupied um, Kurdistan within the borders of Turkey. And then, you know, I'm going to fast forward to this day. And then Gina was killed in Rojelat, in occupied 
occupied Kurdistan. I mean, she was, she was killed in Tehran, but it made it to the news right away that she was not from Tehran. She was from Saqqaz, which is a Kurdish town. And then I'm like, no, again, another Kurdish woman killed in another one of these colonizer states at the hands of security forces again. Though what happened quickly after was that her Kurdish identity was erased. And she was a woman, and it is true that every woman could be stopped and could be punished for um, you know, not wearing the hijab properly. But at the same time, we knew the oppression of Kurdish women face. We knew the intersectionality of that oppression. And we knew that her Kurdish identity could have played a role. It not must have. But then it became so quickly everywhere, all media channels started to show her as an Iranian woman and with her uh, Farsi name, Masa, without any reference to her Kurdish name. So some of us Kurdish women activist scholars, we started to be both very excited because there's something that's growing. Women, men, which is also very new on the streets you know, of Iran. I mean, it's obviously there's been protests. These regions have not been quiet or silent. We know the Middle East has been uh, revolting on the rise. So it's not uh, new, but still another very exciting wave and uh, something to celebrate that people are on the street chanting women life freedom. But at the same time, this erasure of her Kurdishness was like a sharp knife again, because, you know, even at her death, her Kurdish name, her Kurdish identity was not to be recognized. And so I think that's why going to the origins of where the chant Women Life Freedom started, again, to celebrate that moment where people internalize it so much. And it is so promising, women, life, freedom. And I feel like there's something there that speaks very directly to what you presented to us. It is women, life, freedom. It's free life, free society, freedom in our bodies, freedom in our societies, freedom in our nature. There's so much there that I think, um, you know, I think I understand and we all, celebrated the quick spread of it, but the erasure needed to be dealt with. And that's, yeah. Um, that's, yeah, I mean, obviously that's a conversation that has been, I mean, it took even a while for her actual name. I mean, her name, maybe some of you know, like the hashtag Masa Amini was like very popular and took some time to even realize, you know, f I remember like it took some days to know that, oh, she actually had another name, which was Gina Amini, Iranian, um, Mm -hmm. government doesn't let I mean they've gone back and like my name is Kurdish at a time when I was born I guess they let my parents to put my name as my like mm -hmm. original name mm -hmm. but they've gone back and forth about not allowing that um, different mm -hmm. during time so but even the slogan of women life freedom um, again like in Farsi being um, I, I personally didn't know that it was a, at the beginning I had no idea that it was coming from Jen um, Jian Azadi um, it was a slogan that like slowly I learned that oh, okay it has this like very long like decades yes. right of yes. like um, kind of um, I guess like that history like if you, if you can like give like a little bit of um, how it, it like be became like a four decades of struggle with that slogan. Yes, of course. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's one to recognize because not just because, you know, to give credit to Kurds, but to because I think realizing, recognizing that really puts us in a right track for building a solidarity, an internationalist feminist solidarity that can grant us a revolution that we look at and not laugh at. You know, so, um, so this, is, this is a long history. It's a half a century of history now because it originated in the uh, late 1970s, the Kurdish freedom movement in Bakur. 
started under the leadership of Öcalan and in terms of the women's involvement, Sakine Jansis, who happens to be from my hometown of Dersim, and the importance of her identity is also promising for the movement because this hometown is an ethnic and religious minority as well as she was a woman who was fighting and struggling against patriarchy from the earlier onset of the movement. So this is late 1970s in Bakur, and uh, a Kurdish freedom movement emerged from a Marxist perspective, a working class struggle, but it was a critique of the Turkish left who wasn't recognizing the colonial question. So then, from the very start, it was an intersectional movement. It was saying, yes, we do need a free world, right? But we need it to be anti-colonial. And pretty quickly, even the male leader of the movement, Öcalan, recognizes that we need to tackle patriarchy. And this was very interesting for anti-colonial movements of the 1970s and 80s. Um, to recognize the patriarchy question, to not sideline it, not to tell women that you have to wait for your turn, but pretty quickly include that as one of the important axes of oppression that needs to be tackled right away. And Sakine Jan Sizz's, uh, her involvement in the movement in the 1980s, and there was, you know, the Turkish coup d'etat, intense oppression of all from working class to unions to students movements to women. Um, so at that moment of oppression suppression, Jansas was imprisoned and faced this um, incredibly dehumanizing torture in the Turkish colonial prisons and as a woman because um, they really tried to use torture and shame against women political prisoners because they were to be ashamed of being raped by Turkish soldiers. But Jansuz made it very clear from the start that the shame should be put on the colonial state. And I should not be ashamed of the violence that I am facing. And that was a very important leap for the movement because her involvement um, in the 80s and 90s, so ni by 1990s, we see increasingly women participating in this movement and increasingly pushing for that anti-patriarchal lens as one of the main pillars of politics for an anti-colonial movement. Now that's very important because if you look at the Middle East and anti-colonization movements in Palestine, you know, in Syria, obviously these movements were important, you know, following World War II everywhere. But, um, and women, there were many important women revolutionaries, so I don't want to just single out the Kurdish movement. But there is something very unique in the Kurdish movement was that there was this symbiotic relationship and the more women joined and pushed, the more they also pushed for an anti-patriarchal vision and politics for the movement. So by the 2000s, so much so that by the late 90s and early 2000s, the leader of the movement, Öcalan, said, only women can bring about a free world. And that's exactly where, in the early 2000s, the slogan of Xinjiang Azadi was chanted and officially was chanted in the International Women's Day and um, Nevroz, the Kurdish spring, you know, the whole region celebrates this, but in the Kurdish language, it's Nevroz. So in 2006, and then followed by Rojava revolution, for those of you uh, who may not be familiar with this, it is in the northeast Syria, and it's a women-led revolution that put in practice many, um, many, many important pillars, such as, you know, co-chair system, institutionalize how that freedom would look like. Obviously, there's you know, steps to be taken to, to, to create that free world for all, but it's been, there's been a huge leap, and so 2012 Rojava revolution that is under attack to this day uh, is where we can say the chant, the slogan, Xinjiang Azadi, was institutionalized, was put in a form of political governing. Um, thanks so much for that. Um, I'm, I also like literally like did not know like all the history of it. So thanks for sharing that. Um, one thing that I feel like, you know, in the last six, seven months, especially being in this context, like being now here in the U.S. 
at the Whitney Museum in New York. Um, one of the conversations that for me has like come up also like my friends who want to like know how to like support, how to um, kind of like show solidarity, kind of we, we've had these conversations on many levels, but one question is what would transnational you know solidarity and feminism look like? How what can we learn from you know these um, movements, especially the, the the Kurdish struggles and um, the feminist movements growing out of Kurdistan, um, and also maybe I'm I'm wondering what are your thoughts about how can how can we sh people show transnational solidarity or transnational feminism? What does that mean? Yeah, thank you. I mean that's 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 a very important question, and I feel like to tackle it we need to first look a little bit into what sometimes became out there since the Jinjian Azadi slogan, chant, and um, since it became popularized, kind of, um, you know, the fear there is that for it to not lose its critical edge, for it to not lose its revolutionary potential. And that's why I think recognizing the roots of it in a revolutionary movement that promises a society that's free from capitalism, free from you know, class and oppressive relations, free from colonialism and imperialism, um, and patriarchy and heterosexism and ableism, right? So this is this obviously, it's, it's growing. The more we enter that field, the more we crave freedom, the more unfreedoms and bonds, right? We feel even in our physical beings, in our bodies. So, so there's been problematic ways that the chant and this movement was, um, was embraced, was brought to the mainstream media. And one of the problematic ways is obviously people who are ready um, to bring anti um, Islamic, Islamophobic, or Orientalist sentiments um, to, to the field of, oh, look, right? So then women are resisting um, Islam because Islam in itself is oppressive. So that's something to, to clear off from because it's not Islam, but it is this form of Islamist society that was very much put, built by the neoliberal practices and you know, by the oppression and suppression of the leftist and revolutionary movements of the 60s and 70s, that leads to this form of oppressive patriarchal Islamism to dominate in the region. So that is one to steer away from. And then there's also liberal um, mainstream depictions of feminism, which doesn't again take into account uh, that women are different. We can't talk about an essential women. We're Kurdish women, we're black women, we are uh, poor black women, we're you know, um, homosexual, poor black, so, so, and our oppressions intersect, but our resistances intersect as well. So some of them do not recognize that for the resistance and freedom to be realized, it had to tackle all these different aspects. And so, for example, gender equality, gender empowerment is not the same thing as a free world that's pushed forward by women. And so, you know, there are, and, and one last problematic thing that I wanna tackle because I criticized Islamophobic or Orientalist depictions, but there's also been some sort of shyness among the progressives, those who are, those who want uh, to appear anti-imperialist, those who are afraid to take sides, to show their solidarity with women who are taking their headscarves, so as if if you show your solidarity, that could make you Islamophobic. Yeah, I mean, that was, I feel like, a huge conversation because yeah. there was like this many, many months of silence from obviously media and uh, there is like politics involved, but also from the neoliberal feminism, right? Like in the West, there was like these many, many months of silence where 
they were not really talking about it, they were not sharing about it, they were not taking sides about it because it would come out as, oh, like they're like burning their scarves and we don't want to say anything because if we say something, it's gonna be like a Islamophobic. Whereas the whole conversation around this is and has been that we wanna live in a world where we all have can make choices of our body and our, have body agency and what we want to wear, whether you want to cover your hair or not, like that is your choice, right? So I feel like that was like a, yeah, very weird kind of experience of like just like seeing many, many months of silence from Western media and Western like progressive feminists and anyone, anyone who's interested in any form of liberation. I mean, if you don't want to call yourself feminist um, for whatever reason, but you still believe in justice, you still believe in liberation, you still believe in um, defending you know, the rights of, you know, I don't know, at this point, like women, et cetera, but not, not saying it or not talking about it, right? Like I feel like creates, there's a lot of comfort zones also, I think in the, in the West that you can, oh, this is not our problem. This is like their problems. It's very far from us and we don't have to be involved in this because it's, it's not here, it's not happening to us, right? Um, and I felt like there was like many, many kind of like moments where I personally found it like disappointing or I was like angry about like the silence or like the way that it was not supported. Even during this event, um, <laughs> I, I was, you know, I was like, I really wanna like, you know, use this opportunity to, um, yeah, use this space, uh, the Whitney as, as a place that can at least like bring to, people together to talk about some of these some of these issues. So it's a very complicated lived experience. Yes, I mean it is a very complicated lived experience for us. Also, you know, um, when you talk about this experience of being a woman in the region. And being a woman everywhere we know is difficult. It comes with body shrugs and you know shame and fear of rape and sexual harassment and it happens here as well. I mean, there's so much that brings our movements together if it wasn't the shyness or what if I'm understood that way. It is really a look at the bottom up and it's look at the oppressive regimes and what they're using to oppress their peoples. And if we look at it that way, we see that, for example, um, I mean, the whole recent um, uh, uh, fight back, backlash against women's rights here in the US, abortion rights. And, and who does abortion rights affect the most? It's gonna affect the you know, poor black and women the most. And so if you look at uh, this being, I mean, and this is not the only form of Christianity out there, right? But this is the neoliberal capitalism aligned with certain ideological religious frameworks to oppress women and minorities and people who are different. I mean, to use, right, like some of this, any sort of difference is perceived as a threat. And so this is, there are very global connections to the ways the oppressors have used religion to condone the inequalities and injustices of a racial capitalist patriarchal system here and there. So in here, it seems to be that it's used in form of abortion or motherhood, right? Like things that we need to be still, harassments that we still need to keep inside. And there as well, that it is a restrictive world that prevents our imaginaries, our bodies, our beings, our identities, to be free, and it is done in the name of religion. So it's not Islam, but it is Islamism that's pushed in the region as an agenda accompanying neoliberal capitalism of the 70s and 80s. This is very important because Islamism was used throughout the region, in Iran, in the Middle East, Turkey, North Africa. These are the regions that I look more closely at that how the 60s and 70s vibrant freedom movements with all their problems were suppressed and oppressed and criminalized by the use of Islamism in this form that's being pushed onto the people. So it's not people's Islam. 
it's Islamism of the regime of the power holders. Yeah, which is a very important distinction to understand, I think. Um, so thanks, thanks for sharing that. I have like one mm, question, um, oh, two questions, that, and then we can open it up to um, the audience. Uh, one is about imagination and reimagination, which has been a vital aspect of, I think, the Kurdish uh, freedom movement building. Um, of course, you know, I think one thing that is really powerful with the woman life freedom um, slogan is the word life, which um, it's not just a word that gets used as a noun, but also it's a word that gets used it's as a verb, right? Like to um, life as living, life as being alive, an important factor in the, in the work that has been done. So um, I want to kind of learn about your thoughts about this notion of reimagining, like really, you know, when we talk about abol like abol abolition or like abolitionist or like how do you destroy something completely and start from the be beginning, I feel like that's something that has happened with the way that um, Kurdish struggles and Kurdish movement building uh, has become a great, great example of like really building something from the roots that is at least trying to be different. As you said, of course, it's not perfect, but at the same time, um, what is the power of reimagination in that place? Yeah, thank you for that question. That's, I think that's very important, and that's um, where the Kurdish movement has done some work. I mean, other movements, even here, right, like abolition, Abolitionist politics is not just about abolishing capitalism and patriarchy and other forms of oppression. It's about what are we going to build instead? How are we going to take our imagination and let it run free from what have constituted us, which is this particular society that we're paid, built, raised, right, in this particular society. So how can you free yourself from the terms, the concepts, the ways of thinking, the psychological conundrums, and everything that the society um, has, has raised us as? So the Kurdish freedom movement, um, for example, one of the very important aspects of the movement was um, most of the anti-colonial movements in the region um, have wanted their own nation states and they thought of that as freedom. But then, right, like as soon as uh, they were decolonized in some form and um, they, they found themselves in the grasps of many, many other unfreedoms. And so the Kurdish freedom movement became, especially in the uh, early 2000s, very critical of the nation state model. And they put forward another concept called democratic confederalism. And they said, we don't need to rule ourselves in the form of nation states because nation states ultimately push one language. Even those that recognize many languages, there's still this notion of nation which can be oppressive, suppressive. And so, for example, um, the Kurdish freedom movement's democratic confederalism model is all about bottom-up governance and coordination from local to higher up. And so at different levels, including many different religions, which in the Middle East especially, these are religions, ethnic groups that were pitted against each other, against by power holders. It's not, you know, naturally that these groups have been fighting, but the politics, the colonial politics, the imperial politics that were imposed upon in the region uh, made groups um, very contradictory and sometimes, you know, the enmities grew among them. So instead, so if you really start to govern ourselves and be invested in building society instead of state. So there's the idea that if you demand your own nation state, you can still build these oppressive structures. So how can you strengthen, empower the local? And that's been very important. Another important concept, especially for us here, is the concept of genealogy. So that's women's science. So that's understanding science, society, being, 
from the perspective of women. So it's very different from, for example, um, women's emancipation. It's very different from women's empowerment because the belief is that women cannot be, equality would not mean anything in an unequal society. So what would mean if women become bosses, if there's still class relations in society? What would mean if a woman becomes a president, if there's still you know, rulers ruling over the society instead of strengthening people's will to govern their own relations and to have stakes in building from local, building from bottom up. And there's been, you know, many others from friendship to love to sexuality that how can we really um, get out of what Öcalan, the leader of the movement and, you know, many various others, the genealogy committee, for example, there's also in terms of knowledge production, it's very important that they care so much about collective knowledge production. So this is something I also care about in my work because, you know, decolonial knowledge production has become popularized, but it's still very much in the ownership of academia, academics, elitist organizations, institutions. So it's democratizing um, knowledge, democratizing also a notion of self-defense. And, you know, that's a very complicated concept also, which most people associate with uh, military or power like that, but it is very much of defending yourself and society against oppression and preventing from oppressive institutions from being formed. Because there's the fear and there's, you know, the knowledge that freeing yourself from one form of oppression doesn't guarantee freedom. Another one can quickly emerge and take its place. And so changing mentalities, psyches, concepts, vocabularies is a start to reimagine a world, right, following evolution, following the downfall of the systems of oppression that we fight against. Thank you so much for that. Which brings me to my last question, also relevant to the work you do as an academic. We talked about this for a while when we met, um, but kind of uh, these two worlds that you're involved with, one is as an academic, so if you want to talk about that a little bit, and also being involved with um, the, the, the emergency uh, committee of Rojava, and kind of how do these two worlds come together for you? You know, I, I think about this a lot of time, what does it mean to be an artist, but also do the work that um, activates spaces, that connects to real world, issues and problems, make, make work that doesn't only stays in the walls of a museum or gallery, or if it does, how do you activate it again to, to other levels, which maybe this is an example of, um, but how has that for you, I guess I'm interested in the ways that you bring these worlds together. Um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, your work is, is exemplary in that sense, because, you know, s since since I entered academia, there's always been academics or critical of academia, so that's nothing new. But I've always seen in academics, right? I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in a sociology department, sociology, anthropology, these are my home bases. And there's a lot of talk about neoliberalism and you know, uh, the different forms of oppression and racism. And then at some point, I'm like, we don't even teach a class on social movements. I mean, which is okay. There's people who teach classes on social movements. But the texts that we read are like always analyzing something from a ball. And, you know, at some point, it's like, well, why aren't we not reading the texts of activists? Why aren't we not translating them more? Why is there this notion of objectivity? And every time I started to like talk and bring uh, the perspectives of activists, people in the movements into the picture and talk like them, because I at some point started to abandon like the theoretical conceptual languages that I benefit from, they help me understand the complexities of, let's say, power relations in the sense. But when you start using them, you really distance yourself 
from people and what they can understand and you are creating yourself a space. Uh, um, so, but, but then when I started using the movement's terminology, I was blamed to be not objective. And so that was a call for me. It's like, what does objectivity mean? So objectivity is analyzing from above. I am all for critical thinking and I share my critical perspectives and visions in the movements that I participate in. There's quite a bit of self-critique there as well, believe it or not, in the movements. But there's a lot of knowledge production in the movement that is you know, not circulating adequately, especially if you're doing internationalist work, right? You are the one who reads in that language and translates it in your own words, publish it in your own words. So um, the building of that bridge has become more and more important for me. And so try to, as much as I can, like do translations of the actual activists or bring them and have them talk and you know these kinds of spaces so and the emergency committee for rojava is important and it came out uh, from that silence that you talked about i heard something in my conversations with women from rojava there were some things that really moved me and one of them was you know maybe some connections to what you presented us here one of the women um leaders, revolutionaries, he was being involved in the movement for decades, was born as the ninth girl in a family. And she said that my sisters looked at her with such disappointment because sisters knew the disappointment that the family will face, that they still don't have another boy. That at that, and the sisters um, tell this to her, that she gave them as a baby, a newborn, such a look. And that was so powerful for me because I'm like, that's the look that we need. And she is now, you know, one of the important figures. And she is, you know, um, also pushing for this and also shared an anecdote with me about a woman who said, you know, previously we wouldn't be on the streets like after 7 p.m. because there would be so much harassment that you'd just rather not go. And now I can be on the streets with my, you know, young daughter and we could not be harassed because there's Asayish, women's Asayish units. These are the self-defense units of women who attend women's calls. And that discouraged harassment so much. And so, you know, these are the things that again, it, Rojava revolution started in 2012. It's under attacks. And for me to protect these gains for a step towards imagining a free society. And I'm aware very much that there is ways to go. But I think it's a quite important step, and one of my friends, Dilar Dirik, who wrote about the Kurdish women's movement, for anyone who's interested, her book came out at the beginning of the uh, year, and it's, it's very nice. And she said something in the book, to be generous to the movements. That they're, it's not, they're not gonna be perfect, they're gonna have a lot to deal with, but as long as there's, there are important steps, and that's why I also brought some of our brochures of our committee on women's freedom and on ecological freedom, because women, life freedom is a free world with women and nature and us imagining a different world um, where we can just be. So that's... that's um, that's why I care so, about this, and I brought some in case um, to, for those of you who may be interested. Thank you. That's yeah. such a beautiful ending. Um, thanks so much for being here, and uh, yeah, now we can uh, open it. I, I don't know how much time we have, like 10, 15 minutes maybe, open it to questions. If there is any, um, we have a microphone going around. Thank you so much. This was wonderful and it's so rare and unique <laughs> like to just be in the space with this amazing, amazing talk. My question is that we are like 
one way or another, we, we in our hyphenated identities, we are also living in the diaspora. We're far. And um, there are times that your identity, your root identity, like, is at odds with the politics of your surrogate home. Um, my question for you is that um, while there's a lot of resonances with what is going on in Iran and like, you know, um, a lot of activism that has been going on, like the geography, the history of our region, but I just want to hear about your experience and your observation about how, as a person living in America, seeing all the things that's happening and then the left the left in America is like almost like I don't know it's always in the inception you know or like it has just like a lot of um difference with the left that we talk about like in our region and the right has its own agenda like very cleared out so um my question is that like even like when we are trying to raise so much awareness, like at the end of the day, as an American, like the American identity that like comes at place, how, how can we have more impact? How can we have like politically um, more, um, more, um, more effect on, on the changing of the destiny of our troubled region in a way, like because there's so much that is out of our hands and it's like, in the West End. So I just am wondering to hear your thoughts on that. So um, yeah, I mean that's you know those are those are moments, right? Those are um, moments that all of us who are from regions <laughs> elsewhere feel when something happens back home, and that. Even though, you know, in my case, that back home is one that I can't even enter because of the type of work I do, because my home is colonized under Turkey. I'm like, well, if, you know, sometimes people even don't accept the word colonized. It's like, how come you say Turkey colonized Kurdistan? It's not, because it's not in their imaginary. I'm like, well, let me just enter my hometown then. Right? I don't want the Turkish state to ban me from going to my home and if, you know, so, but I can't because my faith is at the hands of the Turkish state. But you're, I mean, and, and we have this other disappointment, right? That is, uh, we try to build connections here. We try to make connections with the movements here because we believe that the fate of the oppressed here and there are so connected. And this was something that was quite important. For example, in the 1970s, black power movements, the internationalism, um, that even though it's being trying to be revived here, that unfortunately the US left and progressive circles have been um, very inward in terms of, you know, because there's a lot to deal with. And that's another thing that's very tough for all of us because there's so much to attend to in every single movement. You know, I'm part of an also an abolitionist collective. And in there, for example, we often have conversations. Some of you may know Jo James. Uh, she's, you know, done uh, great work on abolitionism and prison activism. Uh, and yeah, the, the, and sometimes she's like, there's just so much to do. We're all so stretched thin to attend, but there's also these preconceptions that I talked about. Um, imperialism understood in a very narrow fashion without, for example, seeing the historical role that the imperial powers have played in the region and put those autocratic uh, regimes in place in the first place, people here, sometimes even leftists and progressives, can side with authoritarian regimes because it gives them some alternative to the US or Western imperialism. And that's such a false dichotomy. It's like these authoritarian leaders were put in place because the left and the progressive movements were crushed in these regions by the imperial forces in the first place. So you cannot now accept the legacy of that colonial and imperial power in the region and side with those powers. So, I mean, this happens to all of us. I'm sorry that I don't have an easy answer, but I have this 
answer that keeps me motivating. That I think unless we bring our causes together, we have no chances of winning. And that makes me to try and try, you know, to reach out to the movements of the oppressed. And in the Kurdish movement, there is a term that's called people's diplomacy. And it is happening. And it is happening between the indigenous movements of South America, black movements, black feminist movements, Kurdish movement. There are glimpses of it. They just need to be amplified. And it's hard when they're not yet amplified. Do we have more questions? Maybe we can take one more question. Thank you. Thank you so much for the performance and this wonderful conversation. And I was really sort of struck by um, something you said about how uh, gender equality is not the same thing as a world where wo like women are pushing forward their agenda. And I thought that was really interesting and this idea of reimagining um, what the future can be. And it occurred to me that you know there's nothing more sort of in line with that with um, than sort of science fiction and the speculative. And you know I thought about the Afrofuturism movement and you know the Arab Futurism movement that sort of centers. Um, the marginalized in this uh, vision of what the future can hold. And so my question to you, I guess, is if you can speak a little bit about how, why you chose um, this sort of sp speculative way to narrativize your story as well as the story of um, Iran. And yeah, I would love to hear more about that. Thank you uh, for that question. I mean, you kind of answered part of it, which is that because I also have found a lot of power in this idea of kind of looking into the future as, yeah, as this position of power, but also reshuffling, through reshuffling something in the past and um, power structures or stories of the past and then reimagining an alternative ways of being in the future. I mean, even I remember like writing this story um, and the part that, you know, I'm, I'm imagining um, this, the story of the safety pin was a, a real thing, like a friend of mine for real gave me a safety pin one time, was like, why don't you just like carry this, you know, like I, I always carry it, like if someone n sits next to me on, on, the, on the taxi cab and like starts like bothering me, I like literally take it out and put it in, in, their, in their leg. And I started like carrying a safety pin with, in my bag always. Um, and kind of with that, I remember like writing this story where I imagined him as it gets kind of like violent, he's like bleeding and then his body starts, you know, disappearing. But in that position, I, I felt some sort of like power in terms of being able to, you know, think about that, that, that idea and, and in a way that then that idea will allow me to come back to my own body. Um, so I feel like that's obviously the power of storytelling, it's the power of science fiction, it's the power of speculation, it's the power of being able to use these languages, these methods of thinking, working, uh, building worlds as a way to, yeah, want something else for all of us. I mean, there, somewhere in the story, I also say that in the future that this is not even a thing, right? In the future when we don't have to even have this panel because it's not even something we have to discuss at all. <laughs> so um, that's kind of what I try to at least do with my work. And I'm not obviously the only person. I, I find the power, as you said, in many movements that are doing this from Afrofuturism to ethnofuturism slash Arab Gulf futurism. Um, and all the, all the ways that these worlds, as you also said, can be like connected. We need to connect these ways of thinking um, we need to build these bridges as a way to build build a world where like it's not just about uh, you know the West being comfortable or like reaching to the you know to a place where these issues don't exist, but like rather a much more bigger interwoven um, way of seeing our struggles connected. And I think um, that's the power of building together in in in, in these ways of thinking. I think we're we're done because at this point. Thank you so much. <laughs>